joining us today. Uh, again, my name is Vanessa. I'm with uh, Legend Smelting and Recycling, or LSR. Thank you, URG, for uh, hosting this event for us today. Um, as you can see, I have uh, just a kind of an intro screen up for you. Um, you'll see my contact information is on the right. I also have it on the last uh, screenshot as a uh, slide of the PowerPoint as well. Um, one of the things that I get asked a lot while I'm out in the field is, you know, how can I maximize my profits? How do I know where I'm going to gain? How do I know where I'm losing? And I want to review all of that with you today. So I'm going to get straight into it. So on our overview for today, we're going to go into uh, ways to sell your converters. Now I have these um, bullets assigned to each slide number. So they do coincide with each slide if you need to refer back to them. Um, but we're going to talk about ways to sell your converters, how to determine what way is the best for you, what do you call a processor, what is the actual definition of a processor, um, what is the term that's thrown out there all the time called assay terms really mean, and why are they important or why are they not so important? How can your buyer help you analyze your data in order to really focus on increasing your profits via your vehicle purchases? whether they are through the local community or if they are through auction. Um, what happened to price lists? Why aren't price lists something that's just able to be given out anymore? And how is a converter value really determined? Um, we're gonna take a look at some sample data that uh, we've actually pulled in from our lab technology um, uh, through Legend, but it'll, it, it'll give you a really good idea and a sense of how parts really are determined based off of their ounce return, therefore giving you a true value. Um, also, should you track uh, what model of high value converters came off of? I have a lot of customers that ask me, should I write down all of this information and should I keep track of my own um, systems and my own high value converters? I need to know what models are producing the highest value and my biggest returns. So we'll review that as well. And also is a cutting method really important? Same thing as the mill type. Are those technologies together really important? Do they have an impact on the value and your return um, of your ounces of material? Um, and also, in kind of a summary, where do you start with your buyer in order to maximize your profit? So we'll kind of summarize that a bit towards the end. I also have a little bit of an additional data on um, metals and how they are mined. So let's get straight into how you can really maximize your profits and let's go into different ways of selling your converters. So you have, most of you have heard of these different, I guess you could say different selling types or different buyers that are out there will offer some or all of these practices. You have average per piece, wholesale, on assay, and the newest is online photo bidding. So some companies can offer all of this. Some companies can maybe only offer one or two or four of these options or three of these options rather. But if you're gonna sell by the average, most of you will take a look and say, okay, well, I have a hundred converters and I want um, $150 for every single one of my converters. That includes all of my low end as well as my high end, and you get what you get, Mr. Buyer. Um, some of us in the industry refer to this as Vegas selling because eventually the house will always win. Um, you've got to keep track of your consistent data whenever you sell on the average. You have to know that when you sell that first time, it could be a lead in to the next bid and the one after that and the one after that to where that roller coaster eventually ends up getting you into a wholesale um, graded by code but less than value piece. So if you go into the wholesale and you're selling on wholesale via by average or by code, um, you want to take a look at your averages every time because sometimes you're going to hit much, much higher than what you even anticipated uh, putting out there as your acceptable bid um, on what you would be okay with selling. So if someone comes in, if a buyer comes in and they have the ability to grade by a code per piece, they're basically going in and they're scraping the converter and they're checking out to see what code is on there, um, no matter what make or model or type. 
So they'll go in, they'll, they'll basically do that for anything that is not have a code on it. Cause some items do not carry a code. Some of the pre's, for example, they'll move into more of like a generalized category pricing. Um, and they call that basically no number pricing. And that no number pricing can often really be to the detriment of the seller. Um, so it's definitely something you want to take a look at if you do consider to go by grading by the code. Um, you want to take a look at how they are grading, what their system looks like. Is the data up to date? Are their pricing systems as real time as possible? And does it match what you've been seeing in that marketplace? Um, if you grade by assay, some of you may or may not be familiar with this term. This is more integrated with hedging in the marketplace. This gives you control over the date in which you hedge your material or your ounces of material and you lock in based on the date um, that the trade desk is offering. So you may lock in and you may say, okay, well, hey, Vanessa, or hey, Mr. Buyer, I want to go ahead and lock in right now. Can you please give me an estimate on the rate? So you get, you are provided an estimate. Okay, well, platinum is, you know, $1,002. Palladium is $2,600. And your rhodium is $12,500. Um, they say, okay, well, I'm happy with that. Let me lock that in. Then you say how many pieces of material you will be providing. A lot of assay providers will need at least a minimum amount. Um, some Folks will say that minimum is 500, some will say 450. Um, it's different based off of which kind of buyer you're selling to um, and how many hands are gonna be touching that product before it actually goes into their assay process. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in some of these additional slides. Um, assay also, you'll find interest rates. Uh, will be placed on either advances and or your final payout. Um, anything prior to a 90-day interest uh, will, will have applied to it an interest rate. So if you're accepting in advance and then you're waiting on your returns, which could be anywhere between 25 to 35 days, you get your final payout and you're owed an additional sum of money. That additional sum of money, if you do not want to wait for the additional um, 60 days or so that's left um, to equal that 90 date where your interest rate falls off, it's, it's matured, um, then you will have interest to pay on that final payout. But it will be, it will have that interest rate subtracted from the original dates in which you did not touch that, that, those funds. So the advance will have its own interest rate um, or it, it, its own paid amount out based off of interest rate and the final payout will have the exact same interest rate, but based on its date as well. The newest one that's kind of come into the marketplace has been online photo bidding. There are some yards going out there that can actually put um, photos online and buyers will compete um, through the internet and they will place bids and they will give you um, bidding options as to how much they'll pay for, for your lot. Once you get that information, um, usually shipping costs um, are something that you want to watch out for for that. You really want to understand who is buying, where are you sending these items to? Um, because is that really the maximum amount? How are you guaranteed um, that that is the total amount that you could have sold um, those converters for versus by grading, by the average, or by assay? And then you want to take a look at your upfront payout versus your return and any chargebacks that they may uh, provide back to you, such as empties or um, uh, percentages of aftermarkets versus percentages of regs, or you had so many diesels or so on and so forth. Um, a lot of those companies can come in and say, oh, hey, but we're seeing that through the photos. So our bid is our bid. So those are the kind of things that you want to just take a look at before you commit um, to any uh, of those experiences. In addition, you're gonna to want to consider the photo bids are very similar to average sales. So when you sell wholesale by the average, it's basically the same thing that you're doing, but what's unique about the online is that it will provide you with um, multiple sources coming into you um, at one time based off the photos. Um, but just be very, very cautious of those, especially with who they're going to um, and what's really happening to those converters. 
Um, but again, you've got your wholesale graded by the code or by piece. That code grading is typically gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck um, during the day of sell. Um, and then you've got your assay. Your assay has a lot less hands touching it, so there's less overhead, therefore that puts more money in your pocket. So now you're wondering, okay, well, that's great. I have these options, but how do I know what's the best way for me to sell? How do I know which one's gonna be the highest profitable? Well, do your research. Definitely find out who you're selling to currently. Um, ask them questions. Are they a processor? Are they licensed? Do they have um, the option to pay you check or cash? If they are paying you check, is it a personal check? Is it a business check? Does it match? Does the business name match any sort of license numbers? Um, can or do they provide you some sort of receipt or at least a statement showing what um, you sold to them that kind of helps you um, really analyze your data and really take a look at what makes um, that are pulling in the highest as far as profitability is concerned in your area. Also, can they help you identify those, both the highest and the lowest, that you are getting that return data off from? And be sure to just go with your gut on this. You always know, I, I, everyone's been in business for a really long time, and those that are the new generations that are coming in and taking over have been exposed to the business as well. And we all kind of get that gut, guttural feeling sometimes when somebody approaches and you just kind of know something's a little bit off. Definitely go with your gut um, on those items. That's don't, don't ignore that. Um, that really does lead us into what is a processor. I mean, cause a, a processor is like open to interpretation, right? So a processor is someone who comes in and, of course, you're going to hear this all the time. Well, I cut them off your cars, so I'm a processor. Oh, well, I take out the honeycomb. I, I'm a processor. Oh, well, but I'm a processor because I have a mill and we mill your honeycomb. Oh, well, I'm a processor. I, I have a truck. I have a business card. So, yeah, I'm a processor. I'm here to buy your material. So you kind of sit there and you've got to really define for yourself what a processor is to you considered to be defined as. Um, a true processor, an end processor, is what will give you the biggest return for your material. This end processor eliminates the middleman, and not just the middleman, the middleman that sells it to the middleman who sells it to the processor, or the middleman who sells it to someone else who sells it to another middleman who sells it to a processor. So it really, you really want to look at your end processor as being um, that go-to for your highest return. An end processor will cut, they will mill, they can offer assay, they can lock in hedged rates, meaning that they have trade desk abilities on your material completed by their own company. So they don't have to call or reach out to company XYZ to get you locked and then have an agreement in a contract that does not offer their own logo or their own company name. Any sort of contract that you are signing on assay or on any sort of receipt, you wanna make sure that that contract fits that person and that buyer that is looking at you face to face while you are selling your product. A processor does not sell your material to any other processor to be milled or liquefied. One way around that is you'll hear buyers often say, no, I, I don't sell your pieces. I, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm, an end, I'm an end user. I'm an end user, so I don't sell your pieces. I have heard other buyers look people in the eye and say that, look at uh, yard owners in the eye and just say it. And in reality, they're right. They aren't selling their units, but they are cutting the material and they're selling that honeycomb. And that's their way of being, um, of telling their truth, but maybe not doing it with integrity. But I'll leave that up to y'all to decide. So a true processor eliminates the middleman. Um, their buyers are fully trained because they are employed by the organization you sell to. Um, training is probably one of the number one factors that will really help identify your success and your highest earned profitability as a seller. As funny or as ironic as that may sound, think about 
the people behind your counter. Think about your sales force for your own company. The better trained they are, the better at selling they're doing, the more quality they're providing. Therefore, it is actually more profitable for you. The same thing out there in the catalytic converter field with fully trained buyers, with fully trained, educated, and continuing educate, educationally trained buyers they are, that are employed by that organization, they are going to come in with that knowledge and not only be able to help inform you, but gain your trust and earn that trust in order to know that you can stand behind the confidence of their training because your profits have not suffered. Your profits are seeing an increase. You guys are seeing that growth and you're developing that kind of relationship. Those are the types of, of processors that can really, really earn their value to you. So those are the ones that you want to look for. And there are companies that offer that. Um, also, pricing is results-based. Therefore, it's overall more competitive. You're, you're going to sit there and your results tell the story. So for you, you guys, y'all decide whose techniques and technology provides the best results for you. It is completely up to y'all to make that decision, but it's also up to y'all to decide what you're going to define a processor or consider a processor truly to be. Is it going to be a processor or is it going to be an end processor? Or is it going to be someone in a truck that comes and picks up your converters? It's your call. So what do assay terms really mean? What is the information behind it? What does this word assay mean out there? Well, assay involves cutting and it involves milling. It involves laboratory and it involves ounce return of payout per metal, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. So You'll hear a lot of companies out there saying, oh, well, my terms are 93, 93, 89, or my terms as shown on this slide are 94, 93, 92, or 95, 95, 91. So we look at this and we are trained to believe the higher the percentage of the term means the higher the payout, right? Oh, 95, 95, that company is only taking 5% of my platinum palladium and 9% of my rhodium. So assay terms are this promise of payout percentage that customers should receive per metal well if you're automatically thinking that and your statement does not show your before processing weight and your material settlement weight can you actually calculate your true metal ounces returned your terms can't technically be figured unless you have all the information right so they have to show you your before processing weight, maybe your percent moisture. There are some companies out there that um, will put a trash weight on there. Um, and then you'll need to know your settlement weight. So without that data and a company comes in and says to you that they can provide you certain terms, they have to prove it. Your Troy ounce return should be provided so that you can calculate your true return. Um, and you want to be able to calculate your troy ounce payout per metal as well without that data terms are just skewed that is a an easy number to be completely skewed in addition to the statement information you still have this non-assay material right you have your diesels you have your stainless you have um and stainless steel often heard foil and wire as well um, but pellets aftermarkets all of those are items that can really significantly reduce the value of your milled load, which we will get into that in a little bit. But those items are something that you need to consider being placed into your assay or out of your assay. A company may be really high on their non-assay material and they could come in and actually contribute that and call that as part of their assay terms. When in reality, assay terms are on assayed material, right? Like you sit there, you think, okay, assay terms mean assayed material. Non-assay means that it's not part of the terms. But I have definitely seen different out there as I'm sure some of you. So 
material that is not in your assay should also not be charged interest um, and should be considered as an assayed ounce percentage of your material. You should be able to look at that and really check out your statement and fix all that information. Those of you that have tuned out that are a wholesaler or sell by the code or thinking that this doesn't apply, it absolutely does. So if you are selling by the code, if you are selling by the average and you aren't technically locking in your rates or hedging your material and taking advances and doing the assay, but you have a company that says, oh, well, yeah, I'll get there with my codes. Our percentages of payout are based off of our terms. Oh, well, what are your terms? Oh, well, our terms are 94, 93, 92. Oh, well, company X over there is only, you know, 93, 93, 90. So your terms are better. So that means you guys must be operating on a less profitable percentage than somebody else. It's not always the case. That's where you can get into the terms enticement trap. That's where that can become a bit of a thought process trap. So how do you kind of avoid that? Focus on the buyer's capabilities and your payout statement whether you are selling by average, whether you are selling by wholesale, online bidding, or by assay, look at that payout statement. And if you have questions or something doesn't look right, ask. No buyer out there should ever say that they don't have the answers for you and they cannot get the answers for you. It is your material. That means it is your money. So focus on what your buyer is capable of doing. Interest rates, treatment charges, sample weight paid, dust paid, advance availability, storage and shipping capabilities, and, and integrity of that storage and shipping. Where does it go after they've just picked it up? So they've, they've graded all of these, they put them into a box, now what? What about additional fees? What about the average waste per yield? What are you pulling in per piece? And what is the national average? What, are, what am I supposed to be pulling in? What are my aftermarkets pulling in? Is there a better aftermarket plan for you? Where your material yield stands comparatively. Just remember that terms are reflective to your buyer's mill and cutting process. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about the mill and cutting process and how your buyer can help you analyze your sold converter data. So I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to cut over to the mill and cutting technology. It makes a little more sense to kind of integrate it here. Cutting and milling is where your material is the most vulnerable. So we're going to come back to this slide, but I really want to hit home with y'all that if a company is not cutting and milling, they cannot control your payout. If they are not looking at having the ability and technology to do cutting and milling or have access to lab technology, they cannot provide you the best possible outcome. It is perfectly clear that. Cutting and milling and lab technology has direct metals result impact. So sorry for the break in there. We can go back. Um, I want to open it up and find out uh, for a minute if there are any questions. If there are, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, Kristen will actually notify me. Should somebody have a question, I will stop and answer that. We'll just open that up for a minute on anything that you've seen so far. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. So how your buyer can help you analyze your sold converter data. Again, this is of any of the four ways that you've sold. Data analysis is as simple as sorting your makes and dividing the total amount paid in that category by the pieces sold within that category. Lots and lots of words there, right? So basically all it is, is take your, all your makes of one model. So let's say take all your Fords and you take all your Fords and those Fords equal this amount payout. You sold 50 Fords. This is your per unit average payout per that make. 
You can track your averages. Your buyer can help you do that. If your Toyotas are pulling in a very low number, there's a problem. Something is going on because Toyotas, 99% of the time, if you're pulling a full pipe out of a Toyota, you're going to have a low end and you're going to have a high end piece. We've noticed that one of those pieces may be missing. And that is something that a buyer can kind of help you keep track of and take a look at, okay, well, here's how many high ends or here's how many low ends. Um, it's just something that your buyer can kind of red flag you on should something get different, become different, or if they notice something that just isn't sitting right on your sold information. Um, take a look at your pre's versus your reg piece count. Um, those should always be generally the same unless you're doing a lot of buying off the street. Um, take a look at your aftermarket tracking by percent of aftermarket per load sold. I have yards that have been in business for years, year, 40 plus years, and they still can't identify what an aftermarket is. Generally, yes, but there are so many new ones that come out that look like OEM pieces. They're very difficult to identify. So you want to make sure that you not, are not being misled when you are selling those. Um, and don't just say, oh, oh yeah, that's okay. No problem. That's an aftermarket. Unless you have that built relationship with your buyer. Um, but take a look. You can see here how over time you can actually keep track of your sold data on your own inventory or however you want to take a look at it. Um, and when you sell by the code or by assay, a summary of your purchase pieces should be able to be provided to you guys. So y'all should be able to take this information at least by the make and really figure out how um, your data is impacting and what you're buying is impacting your overall profitability. Does that make sense? Kind of, it's very easy whenever you sit there and really say, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't think about that. But those are the ways, some, just some of the ways that buyers can actually help you. They can also keep track of, um, I get a lot of folks asking me to tell them per unit um, what they pulled in within a certain period of time. So if I know that I'm going to be out every three weeks, every four weeks, every five weeks, whatever, they know that their dismantler should have been pulling so many vehicles. So then they're able to divide that out by what the dismantlers were pulling a day to make sure that that matches um, what their records are stating. So it's another really good tracking um, mechanism. Another thing too, something as simple as ensuring that your cameras are in the right place, your buyer can help you with that as well. So they can actually walk through that yard with you and say, hey, here are your spots. Um, not that some of your yards need that kind of help, but while they're there and you're thinking about it, utilize that. Utilize that um, resource. So the next slide, let's go ahead and talk about printed price lists. So when you have printed price lists back in the day, they were always considered as, oh, this is the truth because I have it in writing right here. This is justification for the seller and the belief that you can hold your buyer to what they've just provided you, even if the market decreases. And the conversation usually goes, they come in, they've given you, you've gotten that price sheet two, three weeks ago. Oh man, platinum has really gone down since this price sheet. And that's why my prices are lower now. But you are such a loyal customer. I'm gonna honor these prices this sheet shows. Just don't tell in my other customers, you know, because even though the platinum prices have decreased, I'm, I'm going to honor this sheet right here, this price sheet. They're general, y'all. They, they're category pricing. They don't represent true marketplace pricing per unit. They don't talk about current market or refined per piece value. There is nothing real time about it. Even if you got it two days before, when was that sheet created? Why are these printed price sheets not to be used as even just a general valuation guide? Because you're out there going, hey, Vanessa, I'm, I'm no sucker. You know, I, I get it. I, you know, why can't I just use them as a general idea? The source of the data can't be verified. And an accurate per piece value has to be determined not only by current market value, but it has to have some data about what that converter yields, right? You need to know 
that one converter contains this many ounces of platinum, this many ounces of palladium, and this many ounces of rhodium in order to return that data. So you have this price sheet. Who's the, or who is the originator of those prices? So in today's market, the only true way to verify per piece pricing is to sell by assay or to sell by wholesale via grade, go through each one of those converters and providing you that information on the day of sell. You think, okay, well, why, why on the day to sell? And what does that matter? Well, this leads us into how a converter value really is determined. Just so you know that printed price lists will be inaccurate 100% of the time, um, unless it's after your sell. But pre-printed price lists, never, ever, ever accurate. Um, that general category pricing at the time determined prior to the sell date is where that came from. Um, so how is it really determined? Don't let this next slide overwhelm you. This right here is a sample slide. Look at all those samples. Those are all samples pulled in order to determine how many ounces of platinum, palladium, and rhodium were in one coded converter. This is how many samples. Now, this is legend data. This is specifically legend based. So, this is the only thing in here that I have that is directly tied to legend smelting and recycling. But this is how. I wanted you guys to get a really good idea about how processors come in and they can actually identify and really determine and really how much time and data it takes to get y'all accurate pricing. So this is just one code type. And these, you can see the analysis dates on these. Again, these, this is actual true data. So every 10 years, you'll find that these converters are loaded in different ways. Because keep in mind, they're, they're spent in different ways, right? You have, you have dry, you have wet, you have climate changes, you have all these different things. You have coastal, you have arid, you have all these different regions. But if you take a look at the total number of samples that are done, I would say it's a correct way of doing business to give you a good, true representation of what that graded converter is worth. Any buyer that you ask, should be able to tell you how these results are determined. They should be, now they're not gonna be able to provide the details. Oh, well, this average is 0 0.0577 of platinum and 0 0.4106 of palladium. They, they're probably not gonna be able to tell you all that, but they can certainly tell you how those results are developed based off of what their company um, is doing. So if you see this one converter, the percent, the average percent of your of our completely studied development of platinum in this unit is 0.057% of this 100% unit was platinum 0.4106 was palladium and rhodium was 0.0524 our dry weight was 1.58 putting a total average at 125.18 that is your price for this one converter. We update this and most companies working under this technology have to have a rolling database every 10 years. So once something, once data gets 10 years old, it's gotta be redone. So, and that goes back from the first analysis date. So once this one falls off, a new one will come into play and so on. Get a lot of questions about tracking vehicle models for profitability. Um, as I said in the beginning, uh, Vanessa, what make and model uh, can I purchase out there that will yield me the most amount of money? Well, you're going to come into some issues when you do try to track this. Um, the model is very, very, very difficult to track. First of all, that same model, as you saw, had different, completely different yields. And the reason for that is going to be the type of spent honeycomb. You look at your environment, summer, winter, wet, dry, coastal, arid areas, vehicle usage. Was it a short city driving, long highway commute, vehicle age? 
was it scrapped after one year? So was it barely used or was it a complete driven into the ground? And was the vehicle well maintained? Um, you know, was it getting oil change? Were the fluids, um, what was it something that was actually 10 years old, but looked like, looks like it was one? Or was it a beater? Was it completely run down, used to the ground, served its purpose? Those are all things that are gonna result in the differences and the variances that you see here, all of them. That's why you have to, to update your data. You have to track your data this way in order to give you a fair payout. Because if everyone goes in and considers them all beaters driven into the ground with short city driving in a very coastal area, then you're gonna be looking at what is a $125.18 converter. They're gonna average it. They're gonna pay you $117.22 or $113.19 or 11640. So you want to make sure that the results are something that can be talked about. Another reason why tracking your vehicle models for profitability, it's your overhead versus your return. First of all, it does take a lot of time to do this, um, to track it. Um, I've had and helped a couple of yards try to do this. But tracking purchase converters is going to require you to label each year make and model at the dismantling bay. Where are they pulled out? It's got to have either a clear stock number written on it, or it's got to have the, again, the year make and model so that you can compile that data. The buyer who takes those cats um, needs to make sure that they are recording that data um, and it all coincides. So, hey, this one was $295, or hey, this one was $1,080, oh, hey, this one was $700. Every single one of those that they're grading, they need to come back and read off that number to you guys. And then you need to put in your system what you're looking for um, in regards to being able to track that. That compiled information is going to need to be entered, and it's going to probably need to be noted about where the market was at on that date of sell. And that data is going to need to, I guess, be updated. So if two weeks go by and the market's still the same, eh, you don't really need to update. Um, but it, if you start to see some rises or falls, all of those numbers now no longer matter. They're no longer accurate. So you just did all that work. Then the other thing you want to consider is there really is no accounting for aftermarkets and MTs that you are buying in auction vehicles or coming from off the street. Um, unless that converter is already pre-cut, you really don't know for sure whether it's an aftermarket or an empty. Um, I can help train as many people as possible on how to identify an aftermarket, um, but there are some out there that you just really can't tell until they're pulled off the car. Um, but looking at a converter and it looks like an OEM, it is an OEM. You're completely educated. You run a code. So you have access to an app that has a code in it. You're like, yes, that is worth $780. Man, I just that one. Oh, and this other converter over here, it's 30. But so that's just a bonus for me. But this one right here, you go, you bid on that car, you bid it up, you pull it off, and it's empty. That's where you're going to have to start factoring in really your averages and take a look at that. I know a lot of you can really relate to what I'm talking about here. Um, and it's just a hue, uh, it's just part of, part of the business. But it is something that tracking, you, you can't track for that. Um, the second thing on this piece that I want to go into about tracking vehicle models for profitability is going to be going back into looking at your results. So when you take a look at these actual results here, you want to make sure that you are identifying and understanding really how much, uh, what is the majority of metal that you're pulling in so that you can track the market. I think that you need to track the market pricing as much as you possibly can, whether no matter how you're selling. I really think that you need to be on the market and really look at that so that you're always educated any second of the day um, to know that this is where you need to be, should, should the question arise of whether you should sell or not. Or if you have a piece of equipment unexpectedly break down and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, we need to get some you know, cash flow going. So let's go ahead and get into our converter bin or whatever the situation is. 
you want to make sure that you guys are looking at what, what gas converters are yielding what and what platinum converters or what diesel converters are yielding and where is rhodium coming from, where is platinum and where is palladium. Well, let's go into our cutting technology. This is what I segued into a little bit earlier. So I'll just quickly go over this with you guys, but fine dust collection is imperative, absolutely imperative with your results. Um, and it begins with that cutting technology. Um, whenever you cut, you guys have probably thrown a converter before. And once you've thrown that converter, you've seen that glitter in the sky, the sparkles kind of come out. That is all that fine dust. That has the highest amount of precious metals in it. That's all just money going off through the air. So you gotta collect that, right? So you gotta figure out if you're selling to someone who is doing their cutting, are they using a gator blade, a guillotine blade, or are they increasing, or are they doing something a little bit different, something that you really haven't heard of? And are they doing it with or without vacuuming? Because if they're doing it without some sort of advanced vacuum technology, you will have a guaranteed fine dust loss on 100% of your converters being processed. All of your converters will have dust lost, but you've got to minimize that as much as possible. And again, even if they're using the guillotine blade, which a gator blade actually goes in and it's, it's gonna have honeycomb breakage. It's gonna break through that honeycomb. It's a uh, gator blade is um, more zigzag, it's edged. And a guillotine, a guillotine blade is more straight and it kind of goes a little bit thicker as the blade goes up. So the breakage is reduced significantly on those blades by utilizing those blades. So you're gonna to wanna to find out where that technology impacts you. The other piece is you wanna look at your um, increased collection percentage. And is it guaranteed with less honeycomb breakage and advanced vacuum? Well, yeah, it is. So that's something that you wanna look at is your results. The only way to tell though is by comparing your results. So just realize that your fine dust collection impact is fully minimized with the type of equipment that they're using. And when they put it in, you should be able to see your dust being placed back into your final statement. You should be paid out for your dust. It may not be, it may not be a huge amount of money, but again, it's your money. So after talking through all this stuff, where do you start with your buyer? You know, what kind of conversation do you have? Well, determine if loyalty and convenience is costing you. Ask questions and decide if that relationship is working the best way possible for you. Make sure you're comfortable with the entire process. Remember me telling you that the hairs on the back of your neck, just something not sitting right with you? Go with that. Make sure you're comfortable. And if you're not, ask those questions because there is only so much a middleman can offer. If you are currently selling to a middleman, they may be doing the best that they can for you because again, they have to resell to somebody else but it still leaves money on the table. So you have to decide if that loyalty and convenience is actually costing you. Wholesale pricing, profit margins, non-assay material payout, those are three things that you really need to ask about. And in here are some really great examples of the type of questions for each category that you can start to really open up those conversation with your buyer. And if they can't tell you what metal is most abundant in a gas or in a diesel vehicle, that should be a red flag. How do they collect the fine dust? If they say, I don't know, or we just box it, that should be a red flag. How do they process stainless steels and pellets and uh, aftermarkets and all the non-assay material? And how do they pay out for that? Well, if they just say, well, we pay based off a of market rate, Okay, well, which market? Well, the, the precious metal market. You automatically know that um, non-assay material is not considered part of the precious metals, not considered part of the PGM group. Um, those are all platinum group metals and those are not part of them, but they should absolutely be listed as material, not on your assay. They should always be on your statement and you should always get paid for them. Heck, ask them if you can visit their location. Keep it real simple. Can I come see your location? Where does my material go? Um, what do you consider a category price? All of these questions are things that 
we could go into more thoroughly, but um, if you have questions, just feel free to hit me up anytime. Um, and we can kind of go through, go through them together. But these are just some ideas that you might be able to open up a the door with your buyer to start having that conversation. I wanted to just throw out some data for you guys too about these mine metals, especially with the surge that we've been seeing with rhodium. Um, so platinum is mostly used in catalytic converters and jewelry and platinum is 30 times more rare than gold. However, with platinum right now, like I was kind of telling you guys earlier, what's, what's mined and brought above ground decreases the above ground value, right? So in gas converters, gas converters contain the most percentage of palladium. In diesel converters, that's where you'll find most of your platinum. And in your platinum, platinum there's been a lot of backlash right now against diesel vehicles and countries are actually banning diesel vehicle production. So what's gonna happen to the platinum demand, right? It's gonna go down. So the platinum demand is gonna go down, whereas palladium and rhodium are gonna go up. Guess what, folks? Rhodium and palladium are actually brought in from platinum. So you've gotta think, that if they are going to increase production of palladium and rhodium, the main metal is platinum. So platinum prices go down. You cannot extract rhodium or palladium from most other sources other than platinum. So rhodium has extremely high melting and boiling po points, which is why it's really ideal for converters. And also with palladium, palladium, more than 80% of it is used for converters. Here's some basic information. I definitely highly recommend for anyone that has time to go in and start looking at some of these mine metals and figure out really what's happening in the mining industry because the market is with palladium and the jumps that we've seen. What palladium's jumped <coughs> about 41% in 2019 and rhodium has surged at over 145%. So now the market's going to be more saturated with even more unlicensed buyers coming in to ask you to sell to them even more every day. You're gonna get frustrated and more than likely, it is something that can impact your day. And you don't want that to happen. So make sure whoever walks through their, that, that door knows what they're talking about. And I highly suggest you go through and take a look at um, your mine metals and maybe do a little bit of research on it. So overall, ask your buyers questions. Decide which way, which way to sell is the best for your organization because they all have advantages and disadvantages. But decide which type of buyer is the best fit for your company. Stay informed, utilize your resources just as you have with this URG webinar today. And always, always, always speak up. It is, again, your money. Speak up, speak up, speak up. It is your money. And uh, if there's one thing that we know, salvage yards don't like anybody dipping in the pockets of their money. So please utilize your resources and please ask questions. Thank you all very, very much for your time today. I guess we can open it up to uh, questions. If anybody has any questions. All right, well, this is my information as well. Please let me know if there's anything that y'all need. If there are any other general questions I could answer at any time, I could be reached at email. Um, our corporate office location um, is also available and a great resource for you. Um, Kristen, do you have anything else? Nope, that's it for me. So if anybody has any questions, we'll leave it open for another minute or so, but um, thank you all again for joining. Thank you.